um, we are pleased to welcome Zoravar Kalra, the powerhouse behind massive restaurants. Zoravar has taken forward his father, Jix Kalra's legacy by establishing some of India's best restaurant brands. Masala Library, Papaya, Farzi Cafe, Masala B, not to forget the latest, I think, was Tiger, right? Uh, Zoravar. Uh, yes. Welcome, Zoravar, to uh, Travelgram uh, and to this edition. Uh, I would actually Hi, start by uh, asking you, tell us a little bit about massive restaurants because uh, there may be people outside India who may or may not know about the brand. You would love to know from you what massive restaurants is all about. So massive restaurants is a company that we started um, in 2012. And the goal of that, the primary goal of that company was very simple. It was a singular focus to put Indian food on the global palate. Uh, this is something that my father, the erstwhile Jigs Kalra, had spent 35 years of his life trying to achieve. He dedicated his whole life to his beloved Indian food. He believed deeply that it's the greatest, most sophisticated cuisine in the world. And he wanted to build restaurants, not just in India, but across the globe, that actually put Indian food permanently on people's palates and made them realize the genius that goes that goes behind it, genius that our ancestors put into building this incredible, incredible cuisine and how the future generations of, of great culinary chefs have evolved it further. So I think that's what the main goal of Massive Restaurants has always been, to focus on really on, on putting Indian food on the correct pedestal. That's what drew us. Obviously, since then, we evolved, uh, judging by the local markets and, um, you know, the, the taste and palates of Indians, because most of our restaurants are in India. We're obviously in seven countries now uh, with Farzi Cafe uh, but, and Masala Library. We're now, we've gone international. But within India, we've, apart from Indian restaurants, we've also got some other cuisines. But again, the majority of our restaurants revolve around Indian food. So we love, the, uh, we love taking the onus of putting Indian food internationally and, and taking it forward. So that's the crux of Massive. We're in about seven countries across the world. We're in nine cities across India. Our uh, predominant, the largest brand is Farsi Cafe. We also have a very popular Asian chain by the name of Papaya. And we have a, a, the flagship restaurant of our company, I would probably call Masala Library by Jigs Kalra. It's the only restaurant that has Mr. Jigs Kalra's name on the door. And so it, it has a special value for us. There's one in Delhi, one in Bombay, and one at the JW Marriott Marquee in Dubai. So this restaurant is our pride and joy, and we and we are definitely uh, hopeful that um, you know we can we can take it to other places as well. You were saying you're in uh, seven uh, countries. Can you tell us which countries you're in? And also, I think uh, your first uh, foray into the international waters was with uh, Dubai, if I'm not mistaken, Middle East. Um, tell us a bit about your international business. So the seven countries include uh, England. We have one restaurant in London. We're in Dubai. We have three restaurants in Dubai. We're in Saudi Arabia. We're in Kuwait. We're in Oman. We're in Qatar. We're in India. Uh, I think I'm forgetting one country. Um, uh, yeah, and we're going to be opening soon in Bangladesh as well. So actually, we'll be in eight countries. Uh, so yes, it is a large variety of countries. Most of the cluster of our international restaurants are in the Middle East because Farsi Cafe has become immensely popular there. And uh, of course, London is, remains our bastion because it's one of those areas where if you're serious about Indian food, you would open an Indian restaurant. So um, these are the eight countries now. Actually, I forgot. I should have changed that to eight. But Bangladesh is not open yet. It'll open in a month. So in about a month, we'll be in eight countries. Oh, you're opening a restaurant in the middle of a, what yes. is considered a global you pandemic. You will be surprised, Dipali. The market in Bangladesh dances to its own drum. You know, it, be, it dances to its own. It has no effect of what's happening in the rest of the world. Restaurants are already packed. Wow. Dhaka. All restaurants in Bangladesh and Dhaka are packed. So I, nothing like it. Not even England is, is that far ahead in terms of recovery. But Bangladesh is already on top of it. So I don't know. Let's see. Dhaka is emerging as like a, is, as a, emerging as a very cool capital in Asia from what I can hear. There's it a is, lot of movement on art also, of dining also. Very, very good, uh, sophisticated clientele. I think they're all well-traveled. They, you know how capital of India would be, I think similar to that capital of Bangladesh would be. So a lot of good diaspora that, that you know, a lot of, I guess, I'm sure there are expats too. But our, our key goal is to put Indian food everywhere. And that's why we're doing this. And... Um, we, it was obviously not our top priority to open in Bangladesh, but we got a great, great partner. And as a result, we said, 
you know, why not? So these are these international stores, apart from the London one, are all franchised. The London one we also own. So, um, but it's very good to find important local partners because there's no way of sitting in India you can control these markets. You have to have a very strong player locally over there that is that is uh, that loves the brand as much as you do and is willing to put in the effort, the time, uh, the energy into making sure that the brand accomplishes what it can. So, uh, you said you were in London. Now, you know, London, uh, 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 UK has been running this whole Eat Out to uh, Help Out initiative. Uh, did your restaurant, uh, was your restaurant in London uh, part of the initiative? Is it open? All the restaurants were part of the initiative. You couldn't get out of it. Um, the government was covering the entire the ten pounds per head. They spent five hundred million pounds. Yeah, Fifty yeah. million people used it. I think it is an unprecedented success. It's a, a success on a scale that is off the charts. There's no scale to measure this. And I think it was a brilliant idea to kickstart a very badly hit, uh, a very encumbered industry like the restaurant industry. They provide a lot of jobs, even in the UK and India. Of course, it's ex extraordinary. I mean, we're the second largest employer of human capital. We contribute almost 3% to India's GDP. But even in the UK, the amount of employment, the amount of GDP contribution, etc., are very, very high. So, um, you know, the government put their money uh, behind the industry, put a lot of energy, a lot of thought into this program. The program was incredibly successful. A lot of people started going out. The biggest problem, even now, that we'll, all of us will face going forward till the vaccine comes out, is the fear element. Till the fear element goes away, people are not going to stop going out. Sorry, are not going to start going out. And if they don't start going out, the industry will get in deep trouble. It'll collapse. So what they did try to do by giving this incentive is to get people to actually venture out. Obviously, the restaurants followed the protocols. It's been very successful. There have been no outbreaks as a result of the program. And uh, essentially, the weekend shifted. They were able to get people to come out Monday through Wednesday and they came out in such large volumes that the weekend, instead of being Friday, Saturday, Sunday, became Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the whole, it's never happened before in the history of the human race. I think for the past 500 years, we've all been going out on weekends because of the nature yes. of work. Yes. But in one fell sweep, because of a great incentive, that in the country's, the world's biggest gourmet capital effectively changed the weekend. And I think that's a big accomplishment. And it worked very well for restaurants. We're very grateful. It helped us a lot. Not just this, there were certain other schemes they did. They did a furlough scheme where they covered 85, up to 85% of the pay of all the employees in the restaurant industry, which we took use of. And um, I think it is an incredible amount of effort and thought that went into trying to protect and preserve this industry, which is an, in, an indelible and an, um, you know, an incredible aspect of the way of life of Londoners, and not just the way of life of Londoners, London being the global city that it is, without these fabulous restaurants and eateries, the government realized that, you know, the entire demographic, or rather the entire perception of the city could change. So they had to preserve that, and they're very good at that, and they did a fabulous job. Absolutely. So what were the, the you know, what were at your own restaurants, what were, uh, what was, you know, was it the capacity? What was it like? What, did you do uh, outdoors? Did you do indoors? Just give us a little contours of how it opened, uh, your London restaurant opened. We, uh, we don't have an outdoors over there. We have a very small outdoors, only two, three tables can sit over there. But we didn't put that there because of social distancing. Obviously, all the restaurants are at 50% capacity. Mm -hmm. So you can only get 50% of the people, um, you can only get 50% of the people working with you. Uh, sorry, you can only get 50% of the capacity to enter your restaurant at any given time. So that was obviously a, a, you know, a, something that dampened the sales. However, that's required. And I think the restaurant industry is very, very responsible. We, at the end, uh, are, have families ourselves. And the most important thing is to make sure that the patrons and the employees remain safe. So the 50% thing remained, but we have no issues with that whatsoever. In fact, we really have no issues whatsoever with, with any of the policies taken by the British government. They've been super, super progressive, super, super helpful. The way we opened the restaurant was we got all the staff back. They were anyway on furlough. They came back. They set up the restaurant, did deep cleaning for three, four days. We started with a little bit of delivery and takeaway, and then we opened the restaurants. And uh, immediately as the, as the policy was announced, the policy was announced about a month after we opened the restaurant. First month was very, very dull, very low. Uh, people were not coming out. And people were afraid, as is understandable. People were not willing to live, uh, sorry, to walk into confined spaces. They were not willing to walk into restaurants, which has recirculated air. All restaurants have recirculated air. And um, although some of these fears are unfounded, the recirculated air cannot 
create cannot cause the disease but uh, there's a lot of you know uh, misinformation also floating around on whatsapp and other places where all kinds of new jargon and new new crap information comes out which is not even true but either way uh, the we 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 slugged it out for the first one month and uh, the people were trickling in week on week. There was improvement. But the moment this policy was announced and this initiative was announced, we had a huge inflow of people. Obviously, we controlled it. We made sure social distancing was there inside, but also outside because there were lines out the door. So to make sure that people even outside were having gaps between them, and and you know they were not forming clusters. So uh, moving from London, have you have your restaurants opened in the Middle East? Yes, all of them are there. Uh, all of them. Most of them, no, not all of them. Eighty uh, percent of them are open now. Um, one restaurant in Dubai is not open, and um, yeah, no, except the one one restaurant. So out of the three, one, two are open in Dubai, and all the other restaurants in the Middle East are also open now. Yes. So what has been the Middle East experience for you? Because the Middle East has also opened up pretty much to travelers, also just as UK has. What has that experience been? Um, unpredictable. Um, Oman opened, and Oman within a week reached 60% of pre-COVID sales, which was mind-blowing for us because the other restaurants were at 20, 20 25, 30% in the beginning. Um, Dubai has improved. Uh, Dubai is around 50, 60% again, but Dubai is nowhere close to what we're seeing for ourselves, for our brand. I can really talk about my brand. Um, what we're seeing in Kuwait and Oman, we're seeing mm -hmm. a much quicker increase back to normalcy. I think it's also very... Um, heterogeneous societies they're very close societies they're not too much you know tra there's not too much travel so i think they're the, the cases were contained in these countries countries that have a huge amount of inflow of international people or travel they're big hubs like dubai like london like india these places will have obviously um, more, more cases, cases and as a result people will be more afraid to go out so close societies uh, are are at least for the fnb sector are having a quicker recovery quicker. so some markets are doing better than others, and uh, um, overall, we're we're okay with the results in the Middle East. Are we super happy? In some cases, yes, we are. In some cases, we hope that the recovery will be faster because the cost and the and the unit economics are so tough over there that at the current rents, unless the landlords really bash the rents down, uh, even at the 60, 60, 70 percent of pre-COVID level numbers, the restaurants are not viable. So there's still a little bit of a challenge in the Middle East. So, so tell me, um, now if you come to India, what is the situation in India? Some cities have opened, Bombay of course is not open, but Delhi opened, partially closed, shut uh, again open. Um, have, have you opened any restaurants in India? And tell, take us through that experience. Yeah, we opened about 12 in India now. Hmm. So the experience has been good. The landlords, uh, we've been able to get some very good deals. I must say the Indian landlords are far more understanding than these international ones. Oh, yeah, amazing. They, they, yeah, that, I, I was shocked. I, I was shocked myself. Uh, we've got, we've achieved incredible amicable deals with 99% of our landlords. Obviously there's always going to be that 1% that are going to be hard asses yeah, yeah. about it and they're going to create problems. And in some cases, we're going to send them termination notices because if they're not going to understand our pain and they won't understand that at this paltry level of sales, we cannot pay them the full rent. Yeah. If they cannot understand that, then we don't want to work with them. So uh, we're going to probably end up walking out of one or two spaces at best. Uh, not too many because like I said, 99% have agreed. And they've agreed to incredible deals. They've agreed to, they've agreed to uh, deals where um, you know, they're even ready to go on a profit share. Forget about a revenue share. So some good people there. Some people that have understood the problem, not charged us during lockdown. Uh, mm -hmm. Some have, um, which we've said no to, and we're exiting. So, you know, it, it goes like that. But like I said, I think overall the opening experience in India has been um, fairly, fairly straightforward. There have been some problems with people. A lot of our staff, uh, which is the case, normal case in across the restaurant industry, are migratory staff. Yeah. It came from other parts of India. As soon as the lockdown was announced, they all bounced back which is again acceptable because you know everything had to be shut down and nobody knew till when things are going to be shut down. They took it as an opportunity to go back home, spend some time with their family. They've been living outside for years. Um, so a little bit of a challenge would be to try and get them back. Uh, but uh, a lot of the staff that stayed in the, that we made sure that they stayed in the cities or that belong to the cities to begin with, uh, they have been instrumental in helping us reopen these, these restaurants and uh, slowly and steadily be getting our workforce back. So, Overall, it's been fairly, fairly straightforward and smooth touchwood. Um, 
some problems remain. A lot of restaurants after six months, they're shut. There are maintenance issues. AC stop working. Electrical mm-hmm. panels stop working. Fire systems uh, start collapsing. You have to get all that sorted first because okay. yeah. safety is number one priority, right? So there's a lot of cost involved. So each restaurant just reopened. There are these hidden costs that you did not predict, uh, which include maintenance. And then just, you know, the upkeep of the place has to be maintained. Um, the deep cleaning has to be done every few days. It has, definitely has to be done before you open, but has to be done then frequently. So not just the reopening costs money, but even the running costs have gone up because of the use of sanitizers, masks, all those various protocols that we have to follow and we should follow and we are happily following, but the, there is a cost to it. So there are these costs that are there now uh, in, and that's the new normal and uh, the restaurant industry will have to deal with it. Absolutely. So, um, you know, what is the kind of uh, uh, takeaways we can have from the Eat Out initiative? I mean, over there, of course, it was the government initiative, follow, uh, eat out, everything here. The government has not extended any help whatsoever. Is there anything we can learn from the initiative? One and two, what do you expect? I mean, do you think the government, you expect the government to do anything or should they do anything? What is your take on that? We definitely hope the government will help us. The government has been very forthcoming, to be honest. It's not, we can't just sit here and complain all the time. To be very honest, Unlock 4.0 has been good for us. And we must thank the government for taking these steps. They have allowed the sale of liquor, which is a very positive move. You have to understand that 18% of the restaurants that could have opened, opened. Only 18% opened because without liquor, the restaurants are not viable. There is no sale. There is no sale to begin with. So the restaurants are not going to be able to open and uh, make any form of Revenue. If they can't make revenue, they're not going to open it, right? So now with the allowance of liquor, or rather the removal of the prohibition of bars, they have, uh, in essence, put new blood into the industry. Obviously, the sales are still going to take their own time. People coming out depends on their own sense of mind, their sense of you know how well they cope with the fear, how, how, fe- how safe they feel when they venture out. But in general, the Unlock 4.0 has been good. Yes, we would have liked some kind of financial stimulus, but we also realize that India, that the Indian government has limited coffers. I mean, they don't have that much money to be able to help everyone. But definitely there are certain other helps which are non-monetary in nature that I think the government can do to help us now because the industry is in very bad shape. It's been one of the hardest hit in the world. Uh, and there's a known fact across the world, the restaurant industry has been one of the hardest hit. So we really hope that the government can come up with some, um, you know, some key actions that can help the industry. Uh, number one I can think of is the reinstating of GST, input tax credit. Right now, we're all in deep trouble. Uh, There's no money being made anyway. There are huge losses pounding up. People are having to resort to loans just to get the business run along. Um, You know, the reinstating of GST tax input is one of the absolute fundamental things. And I think it's our right. And I'm really hopeful that the government listens to us for that. Um, The opening up of very low or zero interest loans could also be something very helpful the use of the ESIC coffers to pay some of the staff or help them go on furlough could also be helpful for the, for the, you know, for the staff itself because 8 million people are directly employed by the industry. So the ESIC is meant for instances such as this. Um, So these are some of the ideas that I could suggest that uh, would would really be, um, you know, would could could really help us. But overall, I cannot sit here and complain about the government. I think uh, they have definitely done in unlock 4.0, you know, a very positive move for the industry. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, uh, uh, Zuravar, what do you think would, you know, once we open, actually, which we are pretty much doing now, once everything is open, once people actually come back, whether it is now, or whether, you know, uh, the fear dissipates over time, what do you think is the future of dining? What, how do you see dining evolve? Do you think we go back, we'll go back to doing what we were doing pre-COVID time or do you think I, the way we dine, the way we eat, you know, the food we eat will change in some manner? Humans are social at a DNA level. Everything in this world can go virtual. Restaurants and bars can never go virtual. Absolutely. You go to a restaurant and bar to meet other people, to socialize. You go to a restaurant and bar to celebrate life's great moments. You go to a restaurant and bar to escape your normal life. You sometimes go there to escape your homes. You know, you want to time out. You don't want to spend time at home all the time. A lot of people in the industry, all of us, have spent a lot of our blood, sweat, and tears into building these wonderful places of happiness. We're in the happiness business. Um, The restaurant industry is the number one form of entertainment for Indians in India. 
We are 40 times larger than Bollywood. So we are the number one form of entertainment. Indians love eating out more than any other thing. They like to eat out more than they like to shop out. They'd rather not buy that fancy new shoe, but they'll definitely go out and have a nice meal with their family. So it's part of our culture. We've been doing it for years and Indians just, and the quality of food in India is great. And the quality of restaurants is great. People don't get sick eating out anymore. So there are these various positive things that have happened over the past two decades that have made this psyche happen and made the Indian restaurant industry what it is today. So I'm not fearful about the future of the industry. Yes, I'm fearful for the intermediate period. And unfortunately, there will be closures because it's undercapitalization is a big issue in the industry. So eventually, people will start going out again like they used to. I think people want some form of comfort that can come through a vaccine or a cure. It could come through the fact that there is herd immunity. It could come through a fact that uh, people just realize that, listen, if I take all the precautions, I'll be safe. So it, once that fear psychosis goes away, I think you'll be back to the way we used to do things. Um, um, will we ever go back fully? Absolutely. I think I'm eternally optimistic. I think by mid of next year or even earlier, I think I personally think by March of next year, you'll be back at pre-COVID levels in terms of sales, in terms of people going out, and you might even start seeing a growth over previous years. And I don't mean March of 2020, I mean March of 2019. You'll be ahead of March of 2019 by March of 2021. I think that's very much possible, but yes, in the intermediate time, we have to exert caution. We cannot be greedy about sales. We have to be patient. There can be no chance of complacency coming in. We have to make sure that we as a species become stronger. Um, we, this is here to stay. I don't think COVID is going to, it's like the flu. The flu is here to stay. The flu has been here for, I don't know, maybe 10,000, I don't even know how long. After this, it will mutate right? to become less fatal. Sorry? It will just mutate and be Absolutely. less fatal. Or more fatal, I hope not. But I'm sure there'll I be a not. vaccine. Really, <laughs> virus hopefully. becomes less uh, uh, fatal over time. Yeah. So I, I think the flu also used to kill a lot of people uh, yes. 100 years ago. Uh, not the Spanish flu, I'm talking about the regular flu. If you caught a cold, went undetected, you got a fever, you didn't take care of the fever, you would die. Now, I can't predict any of this, I'm not a doctor, but I, can, I definitely read a lot of stuff. I'm a, I'm a, in that sense, I'm a junkie for information. And I can tell you this, that uh, humans will bounce back. Uh, the human race is too strong, too intelligent, too organized to be affected by something like this. Uh, we will bounce back by March. By December, I see big improvement. By March, I see complete back to normalcy. Uh, even if there is no vaccine announced, I think people will realize that if they take caution. I've been going out every day for the past three months since the day I opened my first restaurant. Every day I've been out. I cannot sit at home. Because those three, four months at home were enough for me. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a homebody. I need to be out and about. I, I, get, um, I get clocked down. My, I can't think uh, in an effective manner when I'm locked in a space. So for me to travel, and I do some of my best thinking while driving. So I, I couldn't drive in the lockdown. So uh, as soon as the lockdown lifted in Delhi, I've been out to my restaurant. So, and I exert a lot of caution. I make sure I don't touch unnecessary surfaces. I make sure I have my mask. I make sure that people are six. And I'm talking about my own employees who I've tested and they, I know they have no problems. Even then I maintain all the protocols that I should maintain as a responsible citizen. So I think uh, beyond a point, people will realize that um, it's safe to go out. Once that happens, the, in not just my economy, my industry rather, the entire set of industries within the economy will start to rebound. Fantastic, so just one more question. Uh, what have you yourself been eating uh, during the lockdown? Any experimentation that your chefs have done? Any new thinking on uh, the kind of food you want to serve? What's the last five months be like on that front? We've been, we've been hard at work. The chefs have been working on reinventing almost all the menus. A lot of the cocktail menus have been reinvented. The Farzi Cafe menu, the Masala Library menu, the Papaya menu, the Tiger menu, the Bowtie menu, the Made in Punjab menu. All of them have been reworked and um, they've been enhanced significantly. Obviously, in the beginning, they are also slightly smaller because we have fewer chefs in the kitchen to maintain physical distancing. And as a result, we're, you know, um, uh, we're more laser focused. There's less wastage. The food cost is so much under control. I'm loving it. My food cost has come down. Although our prices have remained the same. Because I'm ordering less items, there's less wastage. So my food cost has come down. Even though I'm using sanitizers and face masks, if you include all of that, that has taken the food cost up by 5%. But Delta, because of the reduction of wastage, my food cost has actually come down by 1% or 2%, okay. which is a very positive outcome for us all. 
uh, we intend to now, this is a new normal for us. We never saw such low food costs. So we're happy now we're going to make sure that we maintain them even when the full menu comes about. Um, apart from that, working on a, some new concepts. I'm also working on some tech related stuff. I can't talk about it right now, okay. but some very cool, innovative stuff that's never been done before in the world. We're working on that. We're also working on... Was it one um, of your restaurants that use robots to serve even in pre yeah. times? My union, yeah, yeah, my union has been doing it since yeah, March of... Yeah, yes, of course. May of Please last year. about it because I think that's a technology that will evolve, that will come the most used today. No, no, no. You can't, robots can't serve food. It's not possible. Forget it. They're not that sophisticated yet. And even if they are, they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm not going to buy a $200,000, $300,000 robot to serve a cocktail. So... But I have this cute little robot. Uh, we call him uh, the UV. Okay, it's called the WII, but we call it the Union ka U and V. And yeah. he is um, he's a very quick, cute little bugger, and he serves shots and, and other cocktails to our guests. And he's been doing it since since May of 2019. Yes. So we yes, kind of preempted this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was fun time. It was just a fun thing we saw. We thought we'd be the first guys in the world to do it, and we were able to do it, and people loved it. Yes, I know. I've read a lot of stories about it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you so much for being with us, Zoravar, uh, this morning. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.